Some of the most common questions I receive are, how do I learn Dart? How do I learn Flutter? What are my next steps in my Flutter learning journey? By the end of this video, I will give you a full picture of how to go from a beginner to an expert in Flutter. Now, before we go into this, I want to make clear that this isn't the only way you can learn Flutter. Everybody has their own learning styles. They have their own pace for learning. But if you are someone that's struggling with direction on what to learn, I think this will be a great resource. Now, this is the flow diagram that we're going to follow in this video. In the description, there's a free link if you want to download it and have it saved on your own desktop. But in this video, we'll go into a little bit more detail on each section and walk you through how I would approach each of these sections. So now before moving into any Flutter related stuff, I would first make sure you have a good grasp of Dart. Now there are two different places where you could start from. You could be someone that's already experienced with programming and you're just moving to Flutter and Dart for a project, or you could be completely new to development overall. So no matter your experience, I would still recommend going through the Dart language tour. I think this is the best place to start for whether you're a beginner or an experienced developer. So Dart language tour can be found on dart.dev and just type in the Dart language tour. You'll see it on the side. It says language and then tour right there. This goes through basically all the basics of the Dart language and most of the things you actually need to know. Now, if you're experienced, you could just probably skim over all this stuff. You don't need to go in depth into every single thing. But if you are starting with development, if you are new to development, I would actually make sure you learn most of these topics. So some of these aren't used very often in Dart or Flutter. For example, runes and graphene clusters. I've never used these. I'm sure they'll be valuable to learn. So feel free to learn them if you do. But, but this roadmap kind of gives you the very minimum things that you should learn with the Dart language tour before you move on to Flutter. So like I said, if you're experienced, all these topics that I have shown in this flow chart right here, you should probably already know most of them. The only reason that you would go through a Dart language tour is just to catch up on the Dart syntax. So it makes it easier. It should only take you, I don't know, maybe a couple hours, maybe a day or two, not too long. But if you are starting, I'll go through each of these step by step. So first, make sure you understand variables very well. And that kind of leads into the, all the built in types. So make sure how to work with numbers, strings, booleans, lists and maps. Again, I didn't really put in the runes or graphene clusters or symbols or sets just because those are probably less likely to be used. So you want to make sure you have a good handle on the ones that are very common that you'll be using all the time. You might run into situations where you do need to use them, but at that point, if you already have a good handle on all the other stuff, it should be pretty easy to pick up. Now, the next big things are functions, operators, control flow statements, and classes. Functions, like it sounds, allows you to execute some sort of function within your application. Operators help you with that as well. Control flow statements. So if a condition is met in your, in your application, one thing should happen, but if that condition isn't met, something else should happen. Classes are a very big topic and you probably never stop learning about classes, but classes that have a very at least basic understanding of what a class is and how to use classes, how to structure your code and object oriented programming way with classes is very important. And lastly is asynchrony support when working with Flutter or pretty much most languages nowadays, you'll be using these things called futures and something that doesn't happen right away. So, so the biggest and most commonly used example of this is calling an API. So let's say you have your Flutter application that wants to ask something from the YouTube API. You send out your request and it's not gonna come back right away. So you need to be able to continue running your application while you wait for that response. And obviously that gets used a lot within databases and all that stuff and definitely an important thing to learn. So once you got all those things handled, we're ready to move into the Flutter part of the roadmap. The Flutter part is separated into three different sections, Flutter Beginner, Flutter Intermediate, and Flutter Expert. So the very first place I would begin with Flutter is just learning what a widget is and the two types of widgets, which are stateless and stateful widgets. There's a very common term in the Flutter community that everything is a widget. I mean, it's technically not right. It's a render object, but just forget about that. Pretend that everything's a widget at the beginning. And your whole app is just a big widget tree of widgets pretty much. So it's very important to understand what a widget is. So stateless widgets don't really hold a state but stateful widgets do hold a state and you update that state using set state. And that's the next topic I would make sure to understand. So I want to make sure you understand how a stateful widget actually handles state and the state life cycle and when and how you should use the set state function. Now the next part is relatively straightforward. You need to be able to handle user inputs and forms. Almost every application, every website will have some sort of way that the user can interact with that application. It's usually through some sort of input or 
maybe some form where they're adding in that information. Now, before moving forward, I think you have the very basics of Flutter kind of starting to figure them out. So at this point, I would make sure you understand how to debug a Flutter application. Most of the learning process is through trial and error, through trying things and trying to figure out how to fix them. And that means you have to be able to read errors and be able to understand what the solution is and how to Google for that solution and things like that. So I truly believe that the debugging part should become very early, that you understand how to do that even before you understand some of the other things in here like API calls and error handling. Now there's a ton of developer tools that Flutter provides, but the two main things that are basic throughout every single development language is using a stack trace and placing breakpoints to see what's happening at the code at specific sections of the execution cycle. So once you have a good handle on those, we can move into these API calls that I was talking about earlier. It's a very common use case within applications. So it's definitely something you want to have a good handle on. And while you're dealing with that, it becomes very logical to go into error handling next because if you think about it, there's a lot of errors that can happen when you're calling the YouTube API. What if you're not connected to the internet? Something in your app should happen instead of just crashing or just freezing completely. You want there to be a little message that says, sorry, you're not connected to the internet. Either connect to the internet or do something else or however you want to handle that error. Just something should be done about it instead of just letting the app crash. Now this next section is database integration. Now this could have a flow chart all on its own just because it's such a huge topic and there's lots of different ways to like methods, how to become more efficient with the data that you're storing, different ways to authenticate and all that stuff. But I'm gonna bring it down all the way to the very basics of just the three main functions that you're gonna be using through a database. So authentication, actually storing the data and then cloud functions. Now, authentication is being able to sign a user in and have his data in there. Storage means storing whatever kinds of data you wanna store. And cloud functions is basically a computer that executes whatever function you need to execute within the cloud that can update your database or do anything like that. And there's tons of different databases that you can use with Flutter. The most popular one is Firebase, but there's also AWS Amplify, there's Superbase, and countless other ones that you can use as well. And the last section in order to become a Flutter beginner is to understand simple basic navigation. And you'll notice I have said with Navigator 1.0 because there's actually two different types of navigations in Flutter and Navigator 2.0 is a little bit more complex and definitely harder to use. But in order to be a beginner, you don't really need to use it. So just stick with Navigator 1.0. It should help you get started building applications that have relatively simple navigations. So now we move forward to becoming a Flutter intermediate developer. Now this is where things get a little bit more interesting. And the very first thing to learn here, I think is linting. Just like I said, debugging was a big important thing to understand early on in the beginner process. I think linting is a big part of the intermediate process in order to have well-structured, well-documented code that follows all the specific guidelines. So linting is basically a tool that analyzes your code as you're typing it. And it can tell you a variety of different things within your code. It'll analyze it and tell you things like you're not following the right pattern for a Flutter application or you're not following the right design structure. Almost every experienced Flutter developer uses a linter. And actually Flutter added some basic linting into the actual framework recently. So you're using it by default nowadays anyways, but some people like to add even more strict linting rules. And it's just, it's just something good to know. Our next part is responsive design. When you're using Flutter, you're most likely developing mainly for Android and iOS. And I mean, iOS devices could be iPads, Android devices could be huge tablets or tiny little phones or something like that. But not just that, with Flutter, you can have web applications and you can have desktop applications and all that stuff. So a big part of your application has to deal with making your design responsive. There are different methods to check what type of device you're on, how big the device is, how tall the device is, things like that. And being able to design your application to work with all those different sizes is a very key point of Flutter. A good starting point for this is Media Query and Layout Builder. These are already built in with Flutter and you could use them to create responsive designs within your applications. Now this next one is definitely the hardest part of development and it seems to be the part where most people get stuck and it's state management. Now I have lots and lots of videos about state management on my channel so go take a look at some of them. And the main gist of it is there's packages built on top of Flutter that help you with state management. Before you go into all the new packages, I will try to understand how state management works with only using Flutter itself. The packages that are built are tools to make it easier for you to, you know, use more state within your application, have things more organized, but you can do it without using any packages or anything like that. Before you get into any of the packages, I will try to understand what value notifier and inherited widget are. 
and maybe even try to build a small application with very small state that you can manage with just the tools that Flutter provides. And then once you got a good handle on that, you can try out the packages and see how much easier it is with the packages. And hopefully you'll understand what's going on behind the scenes and kind of get a handle for how state is actually managed. Now, again, this is a very big topic, so do not get discouraged if it takes you a while. It took me a couple months to be fully able to understand what's going on with state management and be comfortable using it within my projects. Now, the next part is there are some advanced navigation features using Navigator 2.0 in Flutter. And I think a good approach is a very similar approach to state management. I would try your best to understand what Navigator 2.0 does by itself without using any packages. But again, there's lots of packages out there that make it simpler and easier to use. The next section is project structure and architecture. And I see a lot of people getting discouraged at this part too and really struggling with what types of architectures to use for this project. And the hard thing is here, there's not really one right solution, one correct solution. Architecture as a topic itself is very based on opinion. Of course, there are bad practices with architecture that you shouldn't use, but there's multiple right solutions. And maybe the solution that works best with your team makes you the most efficient, isn't the same solution that is the most efficient for a different team. What I mean by this section is to look into the basics of architecture. You don't need to go too crazy and just find something that works for you. Look into like abstraction, inheritance, all those things, object-oriented principles. Look at different project structures and architectures that some experienced developers use. Try to understand why they use it and see if maybe it's something that fits for you. Try some different ones out and just see what works for you, which architecture lets you build the quickest projects lets you and your team be the most organized and is the easiest just to work with. And then we have testing. Now testing, project structure, state management, navigation, they all kind of work together in a lot of ways. And it's all part of organizing your code, making sure everything works. If you don't have a good architecture, if your code's not written to be very testable, you're gonna have a tough time testing. If you don't have a good solution for state management, you're also gonna have a tough time testing. So testing is just as important as any of these. Not only are you gonna be making sure that your application is working well, that things are you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. But actually testing your code also checks that your code is written with good object-oriented principles. And it's like another extra check that your code is quality and it's well-written. If you see that you're having a very tough time testing your code or you don't even know how to be able to test something like this, that's probably a good hint that you don't have great architecture and your code is not written very testably. Is that even a word? I don't know. So there's three different types of testing. There's unit testing, there's widget testing, and there's integration testing. And I see there's a word called mox in there. So unit testing is the most important one that I think you should try to do for as much of your application as you can. Basically test that the unit of code functions how it's supposed to be functioning. Widget testing, test that the widget works how it's supposed to be functioning. I think those are a little bit less important because Flutter tests the widgets that are in there already. So if you're creating some crazy custom widgets or using some package with widgets in them, that's not very well tested. Maybe that's the point where you should add in some widget tests. So integration testing basically tests the app as a whole and you can kind of walk through the app, like click all the buttons, make sure it does what it needs to be doing. And then there's a the word mocks in there. So mocks are very important for any type of testing. Let's say our unit test is checking that our YouTube API call is getting transcribed and used within our application correctly. We don't want that YouTube API call to be a factor within the unit test. Let's say you have the test written perfectly, you're checking that the data is in interpreted correctly, but the YouTube API is down. That shouldn't affect your test at all. The point of the test is to test that your code works. You're not supposed to be testing whether the YouTube API works. So what you do in this case is you mock out the YouTube API. You basically create like dummy data that your application can use. So when you get to that point where you're calling the YouTube API and instead calls your own code that returns you mock data that you can use within your test that's always reliable. And as long as your code is working, it should pass. The next part is animations. And while they are a big factor in a lot of apps and a lot of very professional applications do have a good amount of animations, in order to get something working, you don't need them. So they're at the very end. It's definitely a very important topic to learn, but it's not critical for your app to function. Now, the last one is actually deploying your apps, whether this is to the iOS store, this is the Android Play Store, to the web, to any of the desktop stores, the Linux, Windows, or Mac OS store. That's obviously a very key part of building an application. You wanna be able to send it out to people and let people use it. So definitely something that you should know while you're a Flutter Intermediate. And then lastly is CICD. This is continuous integration, continuous deployment. And this at the very minimum allows you to 
make it easier to deploy your applications with just one click of a button so you don't have to go through that whole lengthy process every single time, but can also be used just to work as a team together to make sure that nobody's adding code where tests are failing or things like that. But if you get to this point and you understand all of this stuff, congratulations, I consider you a Flutter Intermediate and you are well on your way to becoming an expert. Now, the last part of this roadmap is becoming an expert. Now, this level can only be reached from having experience. It is one thing to understand the topics, but it is a whole other thing to be able to apply them in a real world projects and solutions using those topics. So just like the roadmap says, to become an expert, you need to build lots of projects using what you learned while applying best practices. Then as you run into issues, solve them as you go. This will give you experience and over time, you'll finally become a Flutter expert. Now this is a linear roadmap for becoming a complete Flutter expert, but you can accelerate this process by building projects throughout and maybe even contributing to other projects. And by other projects, I mean my projects. And by my projects, I mean Convene, which is going to be the next unicorn startup. You can learn about it more in this video or come contribute right away with the link in the description.